All right, I'm here to welcome you all this morning and introduce to you um, Dr. Schmidt and Dr. Hoppala, and they're going to introduce themselves more fully and discuss with you the topic of um, the role of psychiatrists for adults with cerebral palsy. So I'll let you all go further. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Heidi Hoppala. I'm a physiatrist or physical medicine doctor at the University of Michigan. Um, and I work with Dr. Schmidt, who is joining me. If you wanted to say hi. Hi, I'm Mary Schmidt. I am also an uh, adult physiatrist here at U of M. And we work together in um, the adult cerebral palsy clinic at U of M and we as a physiatrist. So our talk today is just going to explain to you what is a physiatrist and how what the role is for adults with CP. So I'll start with a little bit of background and then uh, Mary and I will just kind of flip it back and forth. First of all, just this talk is not intended to provide any individualized medical advice. We are just giving general information about physiatry and how it can be helpful uh, in taking care of people with cerebral palsy uh, and give some general information of some of the common things that we see. Um, but always you'll have to talk to your doctor um, to get specific medical advice. So in this talk, we'd like to explain the role of the physiatrist for adults with CP. And we'd like to describe some of the health conditions that we most commonly see in adults with CP in our physical medicine clinic. And then we'll also describe some frequently recommended interventions to treat the symptoms that we see. So first of all, what is a physiatrist? So a physiatrist can also be called a physical medicine doctor. We are medical doctors and we have completed training in the specialty of physical medicine and rehabilitation. Our specialty focuses on function and treating the entire person. And uh, in our role, we specialize in treating patients uh, and conditions related to chronic disability. We often interface with multiple different um, other providers, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, uh, neuropsychology, and also coordinating care with other physicians in other departments, such as primary care or surgical um, departments. So this is a, our clinic is uh, the Adult Cerebral Palsy Clinic in the University of Michigan. We um, are a clinic that sees adults with cerebral palsy and focuses on their functional needs or rehabilitation care. We are, um, it's just a physician clinic. We don't have a big specialty um, center like you would, many people have uh, seen when they were kids, where you go see the physical therapist, the OT, um, and multiple providers. That is not what we have at our clinic. We are, you come and see the physician, and then we coordinate and help refer to specialists as appropriate. I would just add that um, we're pretty unique in that we do see adults with cerebral palsy. Uh, there are a lot of physiatrists out there in the world, a lot of PM&R practices, a lot of big PM&R departments and academic centers, big hospital centers. Not, um, It's not very typical to have adult CP specialists, but that being said, I think it's really important to emphasize that you know, the foundation of PM&R is very relevant to treating cerebral palsy. And so um, Dr. Happel and I just want to make sure we emphasize that just because you have CP doesn't mean you have to always have someone who's very specifically trained and, and sees only adults with CP. There are a lot of things that a general physiatrist could help treat and manage that overlap with adult CP. Yeah, so we have the, yeah, as part of being in a specialty medical center, we have the ability to focus in a small area. And as part of that, we have access to some research resources. And that's part of what makes us different. But part of our goal today is to show you what a physiatrist can do and how you can find that in your community if you don't have access to a specialty center. Okay. So next, I'm just going to do a very broad overview of some common conditions that a lot of our patients come to see us for in the in the clinic um, and things that we we make sure we address 
It is not all encompassing by any means, but um, we just kind of wanted to give you a general idea of the types of things we treat here at U of M in our adult CP clinic. So the number one being spasticity, probably not surprising. Um, so spasticity is an abnormal increase in muscle tone due to a, just this continuous muscle contraction. And how I explain to it to patients is that you're getting this neurological signal, you know, from in cerebral palsy, it's from the brain, but in other conditions, it's, it could be from the spinal cord. Um, somewhere along the nervous system, you're getting this, this constant signal to the muscles to turn them on. And so, um, that's not always necessarily a bad thing. It's just a, it's an increase in muscle tone. It can, it can cause problems for patients. And we see it a lot in terms of, of causing things like pain. You know, if you have a lot of joint contractures where your joint is really, really fixed and you can't get any stretch, you can have issues with like people being able to open up their elbows, their arms to do things like cleaning and hygiene. And then it can lead to skin breakdown. Um, going along with that, it can cause issues with like helping getting someone dressed, bathing, toileting, showering, those kinds of things. It, and then obviously it can cause issues with wearing like bracing orthotics or how you're positioned in your wheelchair, in bed. And so that's how Dr. Havel and I approach it in the clinic. It's sort of one of those things we see a lot, but not necessarily always recommend treating it unless our patients are are feeling some sort of problem or limitations because of the spasticity. Anything you wanted to add, Heidi? No, I don't. I think we're good to go to the next slide. Okay. And then I should say that we're going to, we're going to talk about the conditions and then we're going to talk about things we recommend for treatment often for those conditions um, in a different section. So pain, pain is a very complicated topic that probably could be its own hour lecture. Um, and, and often in the clinic, it's it presents as a complex topic for us. Um, and, it, and it also with cerebral palsy, pain can be caused from so many different things. And so um, that's why it makes it so complicated for us. Is, is there a variety of things that be, could be causing the pain? And then there's also just like a whole variety of things to work up the pain, treat the pain, so many things to consider. And so um, it's really individualized in the assessment and the treatment part of it. So it's hard for us to give like a very concrete uh, lecture about it. But just to give you some examples of what I mean by it can be caused by multiple things. So we see a lot of arthritis in our adults with CP, you know, just, just from things like the spasticity or wear and tear on the joints. So you see a lot of arthritis tends to be earlier onset in people with cerebral palsy than the non-CP population. Um, you can also have muscle pain from things like spasticity, what we just talked about. You can have pain from the joint contractures we also just talked about. Um, you could have a pinched nerve, which could cause what we call neuropathic pain, which has its own um, long list of different types of treatments. It's a totally different treatment area than something like arthritis. Um, and then of course you can have soft tissue injury. Anything you wanted to add, Heidi? I just wanted to reemphasize that um, it is a really complex topic, and it's something that, you know, even in a first visit, we often can only get a general, like, get some beginning information um, and start to slowly work our way through the process. Often we have to kind of work through multiple things, treating many different things, or, you know, kind of working our way through problems. So we we can't always figure out everything it's not uh, like easily, so it takes time. Um, so fatigue. Fatigue is another common complaint of a very complex topic. A lot of things can cause fatigue, which is why it's so hard for us to, to give like a very concrete lecture about it. Um, we do recommend for starting with a, a workup from a primary care doctor. It's really important to rule out medical causes of fatigue. Things like anemia, um, issues with your thyroid, um, all those types of things could be treated and, and cause fatigue. And then, of course, that has nothing to do with your CP. And so we just want to make sure we're not, you know, automatically assuming your fatigue because you have CP. Um, so starting with a, a med basic medical workup. In the PM&R clinic, when all of that stuff has been ruled out and worked up, 
We'll talk to patients about their sleep habits. You know, are you getting enough sleep? What's the quality of sleep that you're getting? Is it an issue falling asleep? Is it an issue with waking up frequently? Are you snoring? Do you have something like untreated sleep apnea? And then we'll think about, you know, energy conservation throughout the day. Are you really overextending yourself? Are you working, driving, have kids at home, you know, trying to do a million things and, and really just burning out from both ends? And then along the lines of energy conservation, we also talk to patients about pacing. You know, are you overextending yourself? What if you took more rest breaks? Um, you know, kind of what does the day-to-day -day flow look like for you? And then we'll talk a little bit more about, about this in the treatment section. Anything else you want to add, Heidi? No, I think we're good. Okay. Do you want to take the next topic? Sure. Okay. So the next big thing that we see and, you know, is described in the literature and that our patients are telling us is that they are losing function. Um, and this is, again, very complex topic, um, but there are some common things that we'll talk about today, but it's by no means comprehensive. But most importantly, so your CP getting worse is not a diagnosis because I don't know how many times Mary and I have heard when the patients come to clinic with us, you know, I was told my CP is getting worse or I think my CP is getting worse. And um, there might be things that are getting worse related to your CP, but it doesn't mean that the cerebral palsy itself gets worse. So we, like we talked about our, in our previous talk, uh, last month, we had a primary care doctor there. Like it's important to have a primary care doctor to do your regular medical workup because just like anybody else, people with cerebral palsy can have regular medical problems that could cause changes in function. Um, I equate it to along the lines of people saying like, oh, you're just getting old, right? And, you know, in the, the medical world, that's never a, a, getting old is not a diagnosis either. Um, and so... We want to kind of work it up. So there are so many causes of functional decline in cerebral palsy. And when we talk about functional decline, typically what we hear from our patients is like, I can't walk as it like I have, I used to be able to walk without any assistive device. And now I need to use a cane or now I used to be able to walk without assistance. And five years ago, I started using a walker and now I need to use a wheelchair for certain things. Or I know Dr. Schmidt had somebody come in with, um, new changes and, you know, it could have been, they had weakness on one side of their body and you have to work them up for a stroke. Mm -hmm. Decon deconditioning or weakness is another cause. So deconditioning is what we use to say that with a lack of activity, your muscles can get weak. So I think this is something that really over the last several years, when people were at home more and working from home, some of my patients really noticed that when they, you know, just um, going into work, getting up from their desk, going to the bathroom or walking around the office for those of my patients who could walk, they were no longer doing that. They now had to walk 10 feet to the bathroom instead of, you know, down the hall or down, down a whole nother uh, level of the building. So as your muscles get weaker, sometimes you, they get tighter and you, you have more and more trouble moving around. Mm -hmm. And radiculopathy is a name for like a pinch nerve. Um, in your arm or, or your neck or your back that would cause symptoms down a limb and the, that could cause numbness, tingling, or weakness. Mm -hmm. Pain. Right. And the important thing is that a lot of these things are treatable, right? And so to, to just write it off as your CP is getting worse, no further workup is really devaluing our patient's complaints and, and sort of acknowledging that there are other things involved unrelated to the CP. Right. And I could I be with. Right. And one of the important things that I think during our history that when we see somebody is what is really important is to explain what is different. Mm -hmm. Right. What what has changed? Like what did you used to be able to do that you can't do anymore? And being giving good examples of that to your doctor also can help them figure out like what's new and different and help point point us in a direction of where to start when we're trying to figure mm -hmm. out what's going on. Um, like I've had a patient with a drastic, you know, previously ambulatory, now needing a Hoyer lift over a span of a year and a half. 
And to me, like that is very abnormal versus someone saying, oh, I've had functional decline over the past 20 years. And it's like, well, we're all not as sprite as we were 20 years ago. And so the timeline is really, really important. Yeah. And then we cervical myelopathy is on the list and we actually have a whole slide for this one because this is something I saw a Q and A and that is where we've got a whole slide for it because this is something that is really important to be aware of as a possibility. Um, so cervical myelopathy, cervical means neck and myelopathy means damage to the spinal cord. So this is a problem where you have some narrowing in your neck where the spinal cord goes through and it causes compression or pressure on the spinal cord and the signal is getting blocked. And because of that, some of the most common symptoms people have are difficulty with walking, their gait and walking might get clumsier. You might be getting more falls or just noticing weakness, but sometimes it's really vague and it might just present as like, I can't walk as far as I used to and everything is feeling tired. So it's, it's one of those things where sometimes it's really obvious and sometimes it's really subtle. And it can be one of those things that has slowly progressed over time because sometimes the narrowing in your spinal cord area where the spinal cord grows through is a result of, you know, slowly progressing arthritic changes. So as the arthritis gets worse and the spinal cord area gets narrower and narrower, you may, these symptoms may come on slowly over time and it may not be as obvious. Sometimes you have problems with bowel and bladder control. And that, you know, is something that we always try to ask about in our history um, with cerebral palsy because the bowel and bladder have muscles and CP affects muscles. You can have bowel and bladder problems without having spinal cord problems, but we always try to get a good idea of where you are and if there's been any new changes. Sometimes spasticity will get worse. Um, hand function, because it's in the neck, people who um, haven't had problems with using their arms before, like all of a sudden might no notice they're having trouble buttoning their shirt or handling things that used to never be a problem. And again, change from baseline, right? How were you before in the last five years, 10 years, and how is that different? Um, and the recommendation is depending on like how concerned you are getting some type of imaging study. X-rays won't show the spinal cord, but it will show if you have arthritis, it can look at the alignment. We can have people flex forward or bend back and look to see if the um, there's any change in how the bones are lining up with those movements to give us an idea if there might be something further that we need to do an, another test. Uh, and then this is a picture of an MRI. So I think one of the hard things with many of our patients is it's difficult to get in, lie still for an MRI. So we need to do some type of sedative. Sometimes it's just an oral medicine that you can take by mouth. Sometimes our patients need full anesthesia and they have to get knocked out just like they were having surgery to get these tests. So um, that makes it a lot harder to get. Mm -hmm. um, and so someone who doesn't have CP, if they're presenting with, you know, a clumsy gait, a new spasticity, that it's pretty obvious to a doctor or like, oh, that might be cervical myelopathy, right? It's just kind of a textbook thought we have in our minds. But of course, if you already have CP at baseline, you can appreciate how much overlap there is with these cervical myelopathy symptoms and your the baseline CP. And that's why it often goes undetected and missed. And, and so that's really why we're bringing this up as an important topic. So I can go and start us with our list of common treatments for um, you know, these conditions we just reviewed. So of course, therapy is high on the list. Um, there's a, I often explain to patients, there's a big difference between physical therapy and occupational therapy. A lot of people are very familiar with physical therapy um, as it's, it's recommended for all variety of conditions, but occupational therapy in particular specializes in um, more upper extremity symptoms. So things like hand weakness, upper extremity spasticity. They also focus on things like activities of daily living you know, getting dressed, getting on and off the toilet, um, and then even uh, higher level activities of daily living like driving and working and um, going to school, those kinds of things. So we, we utilize them for a long list of 
things for our patients, but then also, you know, there are a lot of uh, caregiver interventions that that benefit from working with OT. Um, we, I, off, I really focus on helping my patients find a neurologic focused therapist, whether that's here at U of M or out in the community somewhere. The importance of working with a neurological based therapist is that they tend to, even if they don't see a lot of adults, a lot of adults with CP, they'll see things like stroke, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, and there's a lot of overlap, you know, with things like spasticity, using adaptive equipment, bracing, that does translate to working with adults with CP. Um, those therapists are also tend to be more um, understanding of working with chronic conditions. You know, you think about like just a back pain specialist physical therapist out there who um, has to set, you know, very specific goals to tend to your insurance. You're going to get stronger. You're going to walk farther. You're going to do X, Y, and Z, and then your pain is going to resolve, right? Where Versus someone with a chronic permanent neurologic condition, their goals have to be totally different, right? So um, it, it really makes a difference who you see for therapy. Now, on the adult side, insurance is a little different than in the pediatric world. Um, it still will be a limited time frame. Every insurance is different with how much time span they'll allow for therapy. It does need to be problem focused and goal focused. Um, and so sometimes people do get frustrated that like, you know, I got cut off from PT because they said I, I'm at my plateau and I can't go anymore. Anything else, Heidi? Um, I think I just want to emphasize the difference like between adult and pediatric um, therapy as far as with the adult side. We really do have to work it, work on specific goals, um, but we still can get people therapy. I know that it is hard and it is hard to find a therapist looking for a neuro neurologically focused therapist or another name is neuro rehab focused. Uh, can be difficult. And some of the things that I've done like with our patients when we were in clinic is we can look up in your area and look for neurological rehabilitation for both physical and occupational therapy. Often they're affiliated like with a hospital system or you'll see neuro rehab and you'll see that they have PT and OT and sometimes they even have speech. So that would give you an idea that these therapists are familiar with neurological conditions and they would be willing to work with you and be comfortable setting goals that would be appropriate because that is the biggest barrier to getting enough therapy is setting the right goals and being able to uh, get enough visits to start to make a difference. And then oftentimes with, you know, patients who come from places I'm not familiar with, I'll just Google, you know, neurologic based physical therapy and put their town in. And then we we look at the hospital and, and just different websites and try to figure out who we think might be suitable. Doctors, can I just break in to read you a question? And um, I have, sure. it says, I have cervical dystonia. What can I do to improve? Stopped using Botox due to the time frame and not strong enough is the question. Yeah, that's a that's a difficult question to answer without seeing anyone. But I think that for all of our treatments, we kind of we're kind of going through some of the treatment options. So mm -hmm. we, you know, therapy sometimes can be helpful. Um, and medic, you know, we'll go through. I think we have other things like medications and things. Yeah. Like that. So we'll as we go through, we'll see if we can help answer the question. But well, here you go, Heidi. So for spasticity or dystonia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the treatment. So, so you want to define just, we, we emphasize spasticity because that tends to be the overarching movement disorder we see, but certainly we see a lot of dystonia. Um, and dystonia is different from spasticity in that it's fluctuating tone. Yeah. So it can change. Like you could be able to move the, like an arm or leg fully, but sometimes you can't, or it tightens up or it moves in different patterns. It's not always just flexed up against your side or something like that. Um, so for spasticity, we do have a lot of options, um, but even despite that, sometimes it is uh, difficult to get um, the best control of the tone. Uh, so therapies like we talked about can be helpful. Um, and I we do have coming up with um, one of the talks, a physical therapist who's gonna talk about uh, physical therapy and CP and 
we both Dr. Schmidt and I work with her closely and uh, she does a lot of things that are very helpful, not only for function, but um, for spasticity. We can use medication. Some of the common ones that um, people are often tried on are baclofen or tizanidine. There are others, but these are the most common ones that we see. Um, and the biggest side effects for these medications and that limits our use is that people feel kind of sleepy or groggy when they take them. And for some people that gets better, you know, if we start low and go up slowly, they can adjust to them and it can be helpful. But some people, they're just so, sen the medications are just uh, too strong or they're just too sensitive to the meds and we cannot get that up to a high enough dose. Procedure wise, we can do um, the botulinum toxin injections to help relax the muscle. This works better when we have just a few muscles that are really tight and not the whole body because there's only so many spots you can put the muscle, uh, the medicine. So the medicine is injected into the muscle and it works at where we put it in the muscle. It doesn't spread over and relax the whole area. So that works better if you know you have a couple areas that are tight and not responding to um, the other therapies or medications that we've tried. And from a surgical standpoint, um, really there's not a lot of orthopedic surgery for spasticity management in adults. Um, the main surgical treatment that we use for spasticity is the intrathecal baclofen pump, which is an implantable device that's placed by neurosurgery and it puts baclofen right into the spine area. Um, and this is something that's all under the skin and you have to come to the office to get the medication refilled. So you fill up the little reservoir and it slowly is pumped into the spinal, spinal cord area there and helps to like work right in the central nervous system. Um, so that can be a, a good treatment, especially for pe people where the legs are really tight because we put it in in like the mid to low back area and it works best when because of gravity the medication sort of drips downwards so we usually see good benefit in the legs um, sometimes it can help relax the arms but it's not as good as with the legs i don't know about you but to me you know it's, it's an invasive procedure it's a very large commitment and i've right. even heard people describe it as like a marriage right because once right. you put this device in the medication is delivering such a high dose of baclofen that if you, you know, didn't follow up for your refill appointments, you could go into life-threatening withdrawal. And so um, I tend to use it as, you know, once we've exhausted all of our other options. Um, and, and then, of course, it's always something that, you know, I, I try to be as neutral as possible when introducing it to patients. You know, these are the facts. This is what is involved in the treatment. And if someone feels like that is not a commitment they want to make, then I don't want them to ever feel like they have to. Right. Yeah. It's um, something, yeah. It's a big commitment. So I will just also add on the surgery topic. Heidi already mentioned things like tendon releases. We don't tend to do in adults. Um, same with selective dorsal rhizotomy. We don't, we don't tend to do that in adults. Um, there's sort of some experimental research going on with that, but um, we we do not have surgeons here that are doing that, you know, widely nationally, not a, not um, a, a treatment offered in adults. I have had some patients find that online somewhere and they come in asking me for it and it's, it's just not there yet. So. I'll let you talk about bracing. Sure. Okay. So, so there's two big categories of bracing. So things like splinting are meant to hold the joint in position to give this continuous stretch. A lot of people are familiar with like serial casting um, early on, you know, which is commonly recommended for children to help manage joint contractures, right? You get that like 24 hour continuous stretch from having the brace on. This brace you can see with um, this intrinsic hand splint, you can see this person's really Velcroed in, totally locked into position. You can, I mean, the fingers are not loose, the thumb's not loose. There's not much functional, There, there's no functional use of that brace, right? It's purely for stretching to help open the joint, which of course can be very helpful with managing joint contractures for us. But at the same time, a lot of patients, um, especially in the hands, right? You feel really limited uh, in using something like a splint. 
Functional bracing are things we use um, that have more dynamic use for them. So things like ankle foot orthotics will commonly recommend to help our patients with walking. It can be um, super helpful to help lift the toes up. You know, someone goes to take a step, oftentimes they'll have some weakness and spasticity where the whole foot is coming down and then it's harder to clear the leg as you go to advance. And so then your foot is dragging and catching. And so something like wearing a ankle foot orthotic under your foot helps lift the toes up. It makes it easier to take a smoother step. So for patients with um, a lot of spasticity or maybe they have a joint contracture or really need a lot of stability, this purple brace here in the middle is a custom ankle foot orthotic. It's a plastic brace. A lot of people are familiar with this style of brace because it's commonly used in the pediatric side. A lot of people have personal opinions about, you know, the, their previous experience with these braces and they let me know right away. I am not interested in that. I'm not wearing that, but it really does have a good use. Um, and, and sometimes, like I said, if, if you've got a bad joint contracture or spasticity, it can be our only option for functional bracing. We also like this um, anterior shell carbon fiber brace. Uh, it, it has more um, dynamic give to it. It's lighter weight, a little lower profile. It's pretty popular um, for those reasons. You, I will say it is an off the shelf brace. It's not custom. So you do need to have enough ankle range of motion to fit in it properly. Um, and then I will often use super malleolar orthotic or this little like ankle brace I have on the left-hand side of the screen. That's really helpful for people with low tone that are really like, we call it pronated at the feet or, or really flat footed. That type of um, SMO, this is the abbreviation, we like to use just to help give them a little better ankle positioning as they walk. We don't often use serial casting on the adult side. It's more, um, oh, you didn't even, you said I wouldn't mention this. Sorry, Heidi. Um, I would say we just don't do it just for the practical purposes. Right. Um, and it's hard to find a therapist that is familiar with this type of practice. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that what we're, what I found most helpful, and I think same with Dr. Schmidt, is like um, we often have the ability or, or the we, we work with the physical therapist when we send um, the patients to our therapist at the University of Michigan. We have a nice messaging system through the chart. The therapists are really good about reaching out to us. So sometimes we will request in the PT script to try some of these, like the bottom right hand corner some of these off the shelf orthotics, or even they sometimes have some available that mimic the custom ones and they could try them in therapy. So like our patients can get an idea of how it could possibly help because a, a lot of times in the past, as, as a kid, you were given these big bulky orthotics and they might've made your walking look better, but they were so heavy or hot or bulky, or you couldn't get pants on over them that our patients just don't want to wear it. And this way we can try some different options in therapy. Our patients can figure out like, hey, I actually do feel like my walking is better. I can walk further or I have less pain in a certain area when I use this. And then it will be more worth their time to use it at least part of the time. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you have anything else to add with that, Mary. Nope. You want to talk about adaptive equipment? Yeah. So what big part of um, the things that we offer in the physical medicine clinic is discussing like what adaptive equipment our patients have and whether they um, would need some. Again, this is sometimes done uh, really well with the therapist. If I'm sending someone to therapy and they haven't used like crutches or a walker or even braces before, we can try it out in therapy and see if it's helpful. Um, but there's other equipment such as the um, wheelchairs, and um, specialized shower equipment. This is a picture of a tub bench, but sometimes our patients even need more specialized equipment. And we can assess for that or for something like a lift to help transfer you know, in and out of a wheelchair in, to a bed or a chair. Uh, so like the hardest thing with the, some of this equipment is that the insurance has very stringent documentation requirements. So if something like a power wheelchair, we often will do a combined clinic with a physical therapist and a wheelchair specialist for those really customized wheelchairs to get 
the best wheelchair to fit a patient's need and try to help get the um, paperwork done so that the insurance will approve it. It's a lot harder on the adult side to get some of this stuff covered, unfortunately. Yeah. It's like a standard tub transfer bench or something that's in that picture, something like that is typically not covered. But mm -hmm. if you need more customized equipment, we'll sometimes have a therapist help us do an assessment and write a special letter of medical necessity to see if we can get a, a more specialized piece of um, equipment covered. Okay, and then finally, just touching base about surgery. Um, like we said before, we don't we don't have um, we don't typically recommend surgery. There aren't a lot of adult orthopedic surgeons out there. Or different types of surgeons that specialize in adult CP. Um, we will refer, of course, if there is like some significant issue, you know, and I always tell patients, you know, just because we have you seeing a surgeon doesn't necessarily mean you have to have surgery, but as a non-surgeon myself, I, I can't really tell you, you know, what the, the risks and benefits are of going forward with, a, with something like surgery. So like cervical myelopathy, we, we talked about before, you know, that is a uh, neurological urgent concern, right? Because you're losing function to the bowel and bladder, you're having functional decline. Um, and so we will refer to surgeons for things like that. Similarly, you can get compression of the spine and the lower back, which we call the lumbar area, which is called lumbar stenosis. It can present pretty similarly in terms of like, you know, kind of low back pain, worse with walking, leaning forward, um, makes it better. And um, that's another thing you, you find on an MRI. And then, of course, like severe joint arthritis. Um, anything else, Heidi, you want to add surgery-wise? No, not for orthopedic. I think the only one that I, the most common one I refer patients for is the baclofen pump placement. Uh, other right. than that, I've had a couple of patients who've gotten uh, like a joint replacement. But even then, um, you know, it's a big surgery. So... <laughs> Some of our patients do get it, but it is to get like a hip replacement or a knee replacement for bad, for severe arthritis is possible for some patients, but um, because the rehab is often difficult and you have to really work hard to get keep that range of motion in the knee and keep your strength up, it's a difficult surgery to uh, recover from. So a lot of patients aren't always ready to do that. Um, and so then we just sort of have like a advice slide about preparing for your new patient physiatry visit if you were to be going in for a new assessment. So um, the physiatrist is going to focus on functional history. You know, like we talked about functional decline earlier, that timeline is really important. You know, what is the prior 10 years looked like versus now for you? If you have pain trying to help quantify that in any way possible. You know, when is it coming? Where is it? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Those kinds of things are really helpful to know. Spasticity and thinking about prior treatments you've had. We've always, we always like to talk about that. A lot of people with CP, you know, if we have a new patient who's in their 60s coming, they've had a lot of experience with different treatments. And so it's always important for me to know what has worked well. If you have any like you know, a lot of people say Botox was really traumatic in childhood. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to even think about doing that, which is fine. I just need to know. Um, if you are using any adaptive equipment, if you're having any issues with bowel, in particular, we talk about constipation a lot in, in our clinic. Issues with bladder. We see a lot of urinary retention that goes missed. So people, you know, who have been able to hold their bladder for like eight to 12 hours their whole life, and you worry about like damage to the kidneys, um, increased risk for urinary tract infections, bladder cancer. And um, we do have urologists here that, that work with neurogenic bladder that we will refer patients to. Your bone health, have you had any um, non-traumatic fractures picked up in the past? Have you, do you take a vitamin D supplement? Has anyone checked a level for you? And then it's always, always helpful. Any doctor's visit you ever go to to have your questions ready ahead of time, um, writing them down or bringing someone with you. Uh, if you're worried that you're not going to get to them in time is always super helpful too. Yeah. And I think, especially for our patients who have um, 
difficulties with communication, having them writ, write, written down ahead of time, especially depending on the, the visit you go to and who you see, <clears throat> doctors are allotted different amounts of time for new patients. So you may not get to all of your questions in that first visit. Mm -hmm. But when they're written down, then if you have difficulty speaking or it takes a longer time, um, you can get those out quickly. So in summary, hopefully we gave you a good general view of what the role of the physiatrist is and how, how we can play a role in your medical care. Uh, we want to focus on things like function, pain, spasticity, equipment, like we've all we've gone over today. And then, of course, we don't want to um, devalue the role of the primary care doctor, who is super important to help, you know, just manage secondary, you know, all the prevent preventative screening still applicable, applicable to people with CP. Um, and like we said, some of that, some of those situations where a medical workup is needed, the PCP is super important. I think that's all we have for our talk, so we can take time for questions. Sure. Um, the first one, well, and it's a two-parter, I guess, is how can I get to visit the rehab in Ann Arbor, and how far is it from Amtrak? Um, it's on the other side of town from Amtrak. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a public bus system in Ann Arbor that is wheelchair, power wheelchair friendly. There's Uber here, it's college town. So I'd say maybe 10 minutes driving. And then- It's on traffic, it might be 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. And is there some sort of referral that they, cause her first- You would get a primary, usually the primary care doctor refers you. Um, I think the biggest thing for both uh, Mary and I is that we're scheduling our new patients a couple, probably three months out or more sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's still good to have a primary care. Mm -hmm. But just a referral, I mean, we have a whole, like our, our call center has a whole triage system where if a referral says cerebral palsy, they know to put it in our clinic. It doesn't really need to say more than that. Okay, great. Does anyone else have questions that they'd like for the doctors to address? This is your um, time to do that. If you want to either um, raise your hand or type your question in, I'm happy to relay that to them. I don't want to lose this opportunity. Um, so while you're doing that, I, I will just say um, to doctors uh, Hoppla and Schmidt how much I appreciated all I learned today. And I'm sure everyone feels um, more enlightened around um, this topic, shoot, I didn't even know how to pronounce what you do at, at all, obviously. So thank you for explaining all that and taking the time to share your knowledge with us today. Um, looks like I have a comment. I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you so much for having this webinar today and providing this information. So there's a, another uh, accolade. Somebody else says thank you. While we're finishing, I, I I just want to tell you how wonderful it is because that direct information is so helpful in, in people making plans for the, for what they want to do or what they want to share. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is huge for us and my UCP really appreciates that. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. I will say we do. I do occasionally see people that just want to talk about I'm getting older with CP. What do I expect for the future? And that's yeah. a totally valid reason to come. Sure. Yeah, I don't I don't see anything else. If y'all <clears throat> um, just check for the OK, I do, I, I do want to invite everyone to next month. Next month, we're going to have um, Dinah, Dana Ryan, a physical therapist whose talk will be titled, but I haven't had physical therapy since I was a kid. So consideration for adults with cerebral palsy as they age is the topic for Friday. Um, uh, June 23rd, I think it is. Yeah, 23rd at noon for the next talk. So I do invite you all to back at that point for that um, opportunity to learn. And I don't see anything else here. So um, any last thoughts from either one of you? Yeah, I would just wanted to say like, you know, it's really important if you are having some of these functional changes to still get some of that care through your primary care while you're waiting for a specialty evaluation. Um, and not wait, right? You, your primary care knows a lot of these things. 
It's just that often, as we discussed, I don't know who was here last month when we had the talk with Dr. Rabideau, who is a primary care doctor, like their time is sometimes they're not given as much time, which we off, we have the luxury of as a specialist. Um, but if you bring like, I have a, a concern, you know, this is what I'm noticing. I'm worried there's some other medical problem going on and your doctor can start some of the workup while you're waiting um, to see us or another physiatrist. And you also can see phys physiatrists in your local area if you don't live near to us. And that's a good starting point. And if you have additional questions and want to see a specialist at a specialty center, you can always get a second opinion or just get a consultation and see if there's any other things that we would recommend. Great. And a couple things have come in. Somebody asks, is a neurologist a more general field of, she, they say a, a field of CP? Uh, neurology is a different field. Um, and some neurologists do work with spasticity and cerebral palsy. Um, and I think when it, at the University of Michigan, they more focus on like the seizure uh, problems, like at the epilepsy clinic, a lot of our patients who also have seizures will see them. Um, they don't focus as much on spasticity at the University of Michigan. It's just how it's split out. Um, I think physical medicine also does a little bit more, com our training is more comprehensive as far as looking at overall function. Mm -hmm. uh, in neurological disability. So we have a slightly different approach, but a neurologist can be helpful too. Same with like PM&R, we get more training in terms of like understanding, bracing, adaptive equipment, um, the role of therapies, those kinds of things that, that help more on the treatment side. You know, the neuro neurologist has plenty of training and understanding of the neurological problem and some of the treatments specifically to things like spasticity, but when you branch off into more of the specialized treatment, I think the physiatrist gets more training on that. I did also want to let you both know that if a family is attempting to get not just durable med medical equipment, <clears throat> but any kind of assistive technology, we can help with that. We help with all disabilities, not just um, cerebral palsy. And if the, and we have 0% loans to help people to get equipment that isn't covered now, and we will help and certainly advise all the ways they could get it, whether it's through children's special health care, all the ways that they could not have to borrow to pay for it. But if you find that you're trying to get someone equipment, it would be great if you'd refer them to our AT program so that we can help with that because we have money to assist with that. So I just wanted to let you know, um, to let you. your staff know that, and I'll be happy to send some brochures to your office. Yeah, that would be so, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And somebody okay. else wishes to invite you to their podcast. So Scott Jewell says he would like to invite you both to be on his podcast. So um, I don't know. Um, I would, he could reach out to Michigan Medicine with that request, right? For someone to do that. Is that what you'd like? I think so. I'm, is he? He says he has my podcast, Scott, Scott, Scott in the system. So I don't know anything. I'm not, I'm just reading his comment. Yeah. I'm trying to think how he could get in touch. I don't know if you'd have any other information. Um, well, Scott, what I would say is, why don't you reach out to, to um, my compatriot that runs this series. Yeah, Paul. Reach out to Paul Landry, and he can help connect us. Yeah, and then he will help to uh, facilitate talking to them about what he can, uh, what you share with him, and then maybe they, from there, it could be. Yeah, I think that would be the oh, best. Like, oh, Scott, I, I didn't recognize Scott's name. He's a board member at, at oh, okay. UCP. I apologize, yeah, I, Scott. I, I didn't recognize your name. We can... <laughs> Yeah, you can kind of forward your information. Maybe Tracy can forward his information on to Dr. Schmidt and I. Absolutely. That would be great. So if you'd, be, if you'd want to do that, Scott, you can reach out to me at um, tstrading at my-ucp.org, and I'll be happy to do what I can to facilitate that introduction. And Paul also has our contact information, too. Okay, that's so great. We'd be, we'd be happy to, you know, do it that way. Yeah, I think um, that's probably a more direct route at this point, but um, but absolutely either one of those, Scott, if you just um, get a hold of me or or Paul will help make that happen. Tendency. Anybody else have any questions as we're wrapping up here? I just want to make sure you can raise your hand if you if it takes too long to type. 
because I know the doctors have to get back. They've made time for us between their um, their other work to do the presentation. We can't keep them um, too much longer. So, all right. Okay. Well, thank you again. I, I learned an awful lot and I very much appreciate your patience with me and the facilitation today. And, um, and That's I thank great. our audience as well for attending and asking great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all for us. joining. Yep. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you.